As we continue to move through the groups of chordates, the tetrapods were first seen about 365 million years ago. This has been a very successful group of animals. And if we talk about some of the characteristics of the tetrapods, the tetrapods are best known for having limbs with digits. So you can think about our hands and the digits or the fingers that we have on them. The head is going to be separated from the body by a neck. And by having that neck, they're going to be able to really look around and observe their surroundings. We also have the bones in the pelvis are getting more fused together. This is going to help those hind legs um, when they move to really turn and move that body a lot better than what we had in the previous groups. And then also along with all of this, those pharyngeal gill slits, they're going to develop into ears and glands and some other specialized structures. Now when the tetrapods first evolved, they probably were still aquatic, but nowadays we have most of them being terrestrial. So if we begin to go through the tetrapods, as you can see on this slide, the earliest group here is going to be the amphibians. This picture here gives us a snapshot of how the fins might have developed into the limbs that we have with digits today. So there are fossils for the organisms on this slide that kind of show this progression of the vertebrae that became um, interlocking vertebrae that allowed the neck to kind of turn around independently from the body, and also the bones that extended into the fins that ultimately developed into the limbs that we have. One very important fossil that was discovered that helped to show this transition um, to the tetrapods is this one that we see on this slide, which is called titilic. Now this one, it has characteristics of fish, and then it also has characteristics of the tetrapods. So it seems to really be kind of an in-between um, animal. If we look at the fish characteristics, the fish characteristics are gonna be the fact that it did have scales, it does have fins, gills, and then it also has lungs. So it has gills and lungs. And then if we talk about the tetrapod characteristics, and there's a number of them as well. We do have a neck. You do have the eyes on top, as you're kind of seeing here in this picture. We do have a flattened skull as well. So we have a number of characteristics of both of these groups. This particular fossil has been quite important as researchers try to really study and determine how uh, animals were able to evolve into the tetrapods. The amphibians are our basal group of tetrapods. So these are our basal tetrapods. And there are about 6,000 species of these. There's three different um, groups that we have within them. We have the frogs, which is probably the one that you're most familiar with. The frogs, that order is Anura. And these are best known for these very strong back legs. So these strong hind legs are going to enable them to really hop around, jump a lot. Other groups, we have salamanders, which is Uridella. These are known for their tail. And then the other group that we have is we have these that um, really look like snakes, but they're not snakes. Um, these are going to be what we call the apodas. So these are called the tailless ones. So these are legless, they're nearly blind, but even though these are legless, they did have an ancestor that did have legs. So we can see the remnants of that if we look at the skeletal structure of those. Now, one thing that's going to characterize the amphibians is the fact that they do go through a metamorphosis. And we're seeing an example of that on this particular slide. So when they are young, they are tadpoles. 
They are going to be aquatic organisms. They're going to have characteristics of fish. So they're going to have gills, they're gonna live underwater, and they're going to consist primarily on a diet of plants. When they get a little bit older, that tail is going to shrink. So the tail shrinks and eventually goes away completely. And they are going to end up with legs, which we can start to see here as well. Once they do fully develop, these are going to most of the time transfer onto land, although they will live primarily in um, damp habitats. But we can see the um, adult frog down here at the bottom and the adults are going to be the ones that are then sexually um, mature so that they're going to be able to reproduce, lay eggs, and then produce more tadpoles from that. So here we have um, just a look at some adult frogs so as we said, the amphibians, not just frogs, but all of the amphibians are going to be found in damp habitats. Some of them will be aquatic. The ones that are not aquatic are going to be found in damp habitats. We have a few exceptions to that, something like a toad you might think is present in a dry environment, or we do have some that are present in deserts. Those are going to spend a great deal of their time underground in burrows. And the reason that they're staying down in those burrows is it's going to help to keep them moist. This um, is also going to be important when they do start to lay eggs. It's going to help to keep those moist as well. These amphibians are going to rely on the skin for gas exchange. Many of them don't even have lungs. And then we're also going to have primarily external fertilization. And you may have seen um, pictures where it looked like we were having internal fertilization with frogs. This is not gonna be the case because when we're talking about the fertilization process, basically the female is going to lay the eggs and as soon as those eggs are laid, then the male is going to be there and he's going to be fertilizing those eggs. So the sperm will be present and it can fertilize the eggs. So it is gonna be external fertilization and then the eggs are kind of on their own to develop into the embryo, which becomes then the tadpole. The final animal clade that we have is the amniotes. The amniotes are going to include the reptiles and the mammals. And what these are best known for is that they're going to produce an amniotic egg. This amniotic egg is going to contain a series of membranes, which are what we call extra embryonic membranes. We call them extra embryonic membranes because they're not going to be part of the embryo. These are going to be things that actually grow out of the embryo. So if we look at those here, we do have um, them listed here. The yolk sac is going to provide food for the embryo. The chorion is for gas exchange. The amnion itself is going to just be protection. It's another layer that's around that embryo. So it's going to help protect it, keep it from drying out. And then this one here is going to be for gas exchange and then also for waste. So we have a whole collection of membranes there that are going to help support and protect this embryo inside. We can think of this amniotic egg as serving a similar role to what the seed did for plants. Once plants had evolved that seed, they were able to really move away from the water quite a bit and they could disperse their offspring a lot further. That's gonna be very similar here. Once we get the embryo packaged up into this little compartment here, the am amniotic egg, we can move further and further away from the water which is what we tend to have once we do get to the amniotes. A lot of the amniotic eggs are also going to have shells around them. So when we're talking about birds, they will have a hardened shell around their eggs. The reptiles will have a shell around their eggs, although that's going to be kind of leathery. So that will help with the protection. It will keep them from drying out. Another derived characteristic of the amniotes is that there is going to be a rib cage that rib cage is going to help to ventilate the lungs, which is going to serve a purpose in gas exchange. The first group that we're going to talk about of the amniotes is the reptilia. And reptilia is going to include both birds 
and reptiles. So we do consider the birds to be reptiles themselves. So we're talking here about lizards, snakes, turtles, crocodiles, alligators, all of those types of organisms. The first ones evolved about 310 million years ago. And the derived characteristics that they have, first of all, is that they're going to have scales made of keratin. Keratin is what we have in our fingernails. So these scales are certainly going to help protect them from a lot of desiccation or drying out, which is beneficial since now we're getting organisms that are moving further and further away from land. Most of them are going to lay eggs on land. Since they now have the amniotic egg and we have a shell around the outside of that, this is going to be possible for them to do it. So they're able to move that away from the, the water and we don't have to worry about that embryo inside actually drying out or desiccating. There's going to be a lot of internal fertilization We're also going to see that many of them are going to be what we tend to call cold-blooded, or maybe you've heard it called cold-blooded before. That's some of them. By cold-blooded, we're saying that these are not going to use metabolism in most cases to heat or warm their bodies. Instead, they're going to let their environment do that. So you're probably seeing alligators sunning themselves at times, or perhaps snakes sunning themselves they're absorbing um, heat from the sun and that's going to warm their bodies rather than actually running cellular respiration and uh, metabolizing their food to produce that body heat. Now a more appropriate term than cold-blooded is what we call ectotherms. So ectotherms use outside heat rather than metabolizing their food. We will see that in the case of birds, some birds are going to be what we would call endotherms. Endotherms, in contrast to the ectotherms, are going to actually use metabolism to generate body heat. So if we start to talk about some of the reptile groups, the earliest diverging ones are what we see up here at the top, the parareptiles. These were very large um, quadrupedal, so walk on four legs, these are going to be very large herbivores. We don't have any of these around today that we can look at. In fact, these have been extinct for about 200 million years. So all we can look at for these are fossils. But those are the most primitive or the earliest diverging of all of the reptile groups. If we look at the rest of them, they're all gonna fall into this diapsid clade. So within the diapsid clade, we have um, the crocodiles, the dinosaurs, which of course are extinct, and we have turtles and snakes, and we also have the birds. So if we go through and look at these groups, the lepidosaurs include a number of different um, organisms. What we're seeing on this picture is the tuatoras. The tuatoras, we really only have two species left, which if you haven't heard of them before, that's probably the reason. So there's just two species of them. These don't live in the US. We have these living off the coast of New Zealand. And one of the reasons that there's only two species left is that their um, eggs are, one reason why they face extinction or that we only have two species left is that when their habitats were settled by people, Along with the people and the boats came a lot of rats. Those rats feed on the eggs of these reptiles and that has really caused a lot of extinction of many of the species that we had and they're really still threatened today as well. So they survive best in locations where you don't have any rats. So here we can see two other groups of organisms that are part of the lepidosaurs. We have the lizards, and the lizards are going to be the most numerous and most probably well recognized of the individuals in this group. And then we also have the snakes. The snakes you're probably familiar with already have no legs. 
Even though they have no legs, they are part of the tetrapods. So that may seem a little bit odd to you that they would be included in the tetrapods, but they are included in that group because they did share a common ancestor with these other tetrapods. And that common ancestor did have legs or limbs. So somewhere along the way, the snakes did lose those appendages. Now snakes are going to be carnivorous, they are um, a lot of them predators and these have a very good sensory system so they're very sensitive to smell to heat to vibrations in many cases and they do have scales on the outside that are going to help them to kind of grip as they move around on the earth's surface the turtles are probably the oddest of all of the groups of reptiles Turtles are recognized as having a box-like shell. And you can see an example of that box-like shell in this particular picture here. That shell is made up of two parts, kind of a lower shield and an upper shield, and the vertebrae are fused to the shell. So it is part of the organism. The ribs are going to be fused to that as well. The earliest turtles that we have fossils of didn't have the ability to actually retract into their shell. But the ones that we see today, they do have that capability. We know that this retraction ability evolved two times because if we look at groups of turtles, they have two different mechanisms for retracting into their shells. Some of them retract vertically, some of them retract laterally. So some of them kind of fold themselves to the side to get in their shell and some of them just fold directly back to get into the shell. The crocodilians are going to include the alligators and crocodiles. These can be fairly large reptiles and here you see an example of the American alligator. You're probably quite familiar with these. These are going to be predators. They um, do live near the um, water. We have both marine and freshwater species when we're talking about um, the crocodilians.